Are we good? Yes. Great. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for attending this afternoon's forum. Uh, the format that we're going to follow is I will uh, direct you to the website. Uh, we're going to have a co-chair or co-chairs from each of the committees briefly go over their summary, the PowerPoints that have been posted there, and then provide uh, time for question and answer. And if you have a question, please, if you would, just approach this particular microphone so that people that are watching can see you and hear the question. Um, there is going to be academic affairs uh, in here later on. They want us to be finished promptly at five. I think we'll be, we'll be fine with that. Um, so again, welcome. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. If you take a look here at the website, and you'll see the information here under committee progress, this is where you're going to see each of the committees and their PowerPoints. Um, we, we again have been stressing goals and aspirations for these groups. They're going to be touching on that and talking to you about that. Um, this process is still in uh, the work, so we still want you to be able to submit your feedback. Um, the committees, after this forum and after looking at more feedback, will start to work on their white papers. So we'll start to see the plan take more form, um, and hopefully with the outstanding work of the co-chairs and the groups, um, hopefully have that plan ready for the Board of Regents this summer. So it has been a pretty, pretty you know, aggressive timeline, uh, but a lot of work, a lot of hours have already been committed to this process. So again, thank you for being there. And um, Rob and Harold, would you like to get started? Would, would you want the mobile or would you prefer I'll use the podium? Okay. I'm going to unmute this. All right. Can you hear me out there? Yes. No. Now it works. All right. Happy Mardi Gras, everybody. Laissez les bon temps rouler. You know what that means? <laughs> Let the good times roll. I'm the uh, float captain of academic innovation and excellence with Harold Little. <laughs> I told Harold I was going to try to lighten it up. Yesterday was kind of tough, tough crowd yesterday. No fun, no fun. I think given where we are, we need to try to have some fun with this. Uh, so I'm going to try to help facilitate that. Um, so um, we're the Academic Innovation and Excellence Committee, and there's our crew as I continue to torture this Mardi Gras metaphor uh, listed below there. Uh, we've, had, we've had a great team. To, if every time I look at Harold, I laugh, so I'm going to try not to look over there. Uh, we have a great team that's worked on this project, and I think we've come up with some great ideas, and uh, so I'll get sort of right to it. I'm, try, I'm not going to – I promise I won't read this entire slide to you, but this is an example of some of the work we did. Um, early on to kind of figure out where the university is in terms of academic innovation and excellence. We spent several meetings uh, sort of uh, talking through strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and measurable results. And um, sort of the end point, well, the, the beginning end point, the penultimate point where we are right now is we have some goals that we've put together that we've synthesized from a lot of our conversations. Uh, goal number one there, I will read these to you. Create an academically innovative environment that encourages excellence in faculty teaching and student learning. And then goal number two there, enhance and create institutional programs, curricula, and systems to facilitate 
teaching and improve learning. So you can see right there, learning is sort of at the core of what, what we want to focus on. Uh, one category is involved with teaching and students, and another one is more systems-based. Um, and so out of this, we've generated seven, uh, seven object objectives for each of these. And then underneath these seven objectives, we've got strategies, we've got metrics, uh, we've got all kinds of fun. Um, so I'm going to just sort of let you kind of read, read these slides, and I'll hit the highlights as we go through what our objectives are. Um, <clears throat> our first objective is to focus on student preparedness, making sure we admit students who are prepared so that they can be successful here. Another one is to focus on learning, particularly uh, high-level high skills, problem solving, communication, communication skills, cognitive flexibility. Uh, another objective is uh, utilizing high-impact practices, which we talked a lot about the last year uh, at the university. Uh, have innovative uh, uh, pedagogical training uh, for our faculty. Another objective is to, you know, focus on learning spaces and environments, maybe even to fund some of those learning spaces and environments. Um, provide pathways to support adult learners. There was an article just in the Chronicle today about uh, you know, uh, good strategies to support adult learners. And then also trying to go uh, bottom up, uh, have faculty and departments define what they think academic excellence is in their disciplines and use those to help, help us make the university better. Uh, goal number two, these objectives involve making the Colonnade program uh, a, a program of distinction. Um, you know, really work on implementing Colonnade and, and, and directing resources to making this great plan uh, work even more effectively. Uh, resourcing seven programs of national distinction. Uh, reorganizing academic and administrative units to eliminate duplication. Uh, to look for opportunities to collaborate. Uh, try to cut through some of the tedious bureaucracy to uh, help get the bureaucracy to help us facilitate student learning instead of being an obstacle for that. Um, look at alternative scheduling, uh, integrate programs across disciplines with shared appropriate learning outcomes, and last but not least, um, develop a system that stacks graduate certificates, which can be used toward program degree acquisition. So I know that's a lot, you know, I just gave you, you know, couple or three months of work, you know, distilled down into seven slides. So you may be kind of dizzy from that. Um, do you have any questions at this point? Is there enough there to ask any questions? I can take a couple, I think. Well, all right then. Uh, you can be thinking about that because um, uh, you'll have an opportunity at the end here to ask questions too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. And next we have Christian Ryan. I did. He's twice. Thank you. Um, yes, hi, I'm Christian Ryan, and my um, working group co-chair, um, Suzanne, is uh, otherwise engaged, but I promised her that I would um, represent us well, and I think that we do have some members of our working group um, here in attendance. Hi, thank you. Hi, Brad. <laughs> um, so, and you can see right here in our first slide, we're the Budget Efficiency and Infrastructure Working Group. And um, you can see the names of our um, beloved working group committee members. They've been amazing. Um, as you can probably guess, the budget efficiency and infrastructure working group, it kind of seems a little bit ambiguous and expansive in scope. And so we had a, ended up with a lot more, uh, many more goals and objectives than the other working groups. And so um, I'll just go over them very briefly and quickly today. And I highly encourage you to dig a little bit deeper into our PowerPoint when you have time so that you can give us some feedback and suggestions. Um, just so that we're all kind of using the same working definitions, we did um, feel the need to define budget since there are other committees and, and 
groups on campus working on budgetary issues. Um, we took budget to mean for strategic planning, fiscal stewardship. So essentially what we're trying to do is, is make sure that we're responsibly using the resources entrusted to us um, as a university. Um, as far as infrastructure goes, uh, we took infrastructure to mean the physical and virtual spaces and systems on our campus and also organizational structures. So that's a lot. So our guiding principles for our working group, those, that kind of vision that we kept going back to that sort of served as our compass that we kept checking our, our ideas against, um, was that our, our vision is that WKU is a student-centered, mission-focused university that leverages resources effectively, rewards proven innovation, governs responsibly, practices continuous improvement, embodies a culture of caring, which is, I think, a theme that you're going to see across all of the working groups, something that we all felt was really, really important, and fosters transparency and collaboration. So we decided to delve into four areas, um, and that is people, spaces, programs, and services. And we, we hoped and understood that in many of these areas there would be overlap with the other working groups. And since we've been able to take a look at at the goals and objectives of the other working groups um, yesterday, we found that there is a lot of overlap and that's very encouraging to us because it means that we all have some, some pretty strong shared visions. So yes, this is a lot and there's no way that I'm gonna try to cover all this today, but just to kind of give you an idea of some things that we're, that we're working on. Um, when it comes to people, our goal is to create a workforce, and when we say workforce, we mean everybody that works for this university, every employee, um, and that is students, that is contracted employees, that is all the people here that work for, for at WKU. We want to create a workforce that carries out the institutional mission, values diversity, operates efficiently, and experiences high job satisfaction. So we have some objectives and strategies for doing that, um, right-sizing the university strategically, um, adopting a competency model to recruit, develop, and reward employees. And of course, we have strategies that, again, you can look at a little bit more closely, closely on your, when you have time. Um, when it comes to spaces, our goal is to prioritize resources to support spaces that stimulate learning, inspire innovation, model sustainability, and promote community. And again, I noticed there, there are some really great themes that go over all of the working groups as far as you know, spaces that inspire innovation. Um, our first objective is to implement a proactive strategic capital maintenance plan. Um, just a, <laughs> I'm a, a owner of a 107 year old house and I personally know that it's a constant battle to keep things in, in good shape. Um, we need to plan for that. Um, our second objective ensures safety and ex accessibility for all. Spaces continued. Um, develop physical and virtual spaces for active and collaborative learning for all disciplines. Objective number four, efficiently utilize building spaces. In programs, again, we see a lot of really nice overlap. Our goal is to increase retention through the development of dynamic programs that foster a holistic learning environment, build internal and external partnerships, prepare students for lifelong citizenship, and cultivate a sense of belonging. To do that, we want to position academic programs to support our student-centered student applied research mission, engage students beyond the classroom through a range of extracurricular and co-curricular programming, improve the four-year graduation rate, and strengthen relationships within the WKU community. When it comes to services, we don't feel like we're, we're done. We have some more work to do in this area, as we do with all of the areas. They're all a work in progress. Um, our goal is to deliver services that ensure safety and security, enrich health and well-being, model innovation and efficiency, and advance student success. Um, so our first objective is to align student services with student needs. And our second objective here is to provide students, faculty, and staff exceptional services at the right time and in the right space. That's kind of a placeholder. Um, I'm sure there's a, a more elegant way to say that. And then objective three is to increase student financial security. And as you can see, we've got strategies um, behind all of these objectives that we think will get us there. So 
So um, that's a very, very brief overview of what we're looking, what we're working on, and we certainly hope that you'll look a little bit more closely at our at our work and give us some feedback. Do you all have any? Does anybody have any questions for right now? Okay. Well, you know where to find Suzanne and I if, if you do have questions later as you study our, our PowerPoint a little bit more closely. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. There will be also time um, at the end of the program if you think of a question that you would like to ask any of the groups. And so now diversity, equity, and inclusion. Which one? Do you want to come to oh, I'm fine. I'm just, Christian's a little shorter than I am. Well, actually a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Molly Kirby, and this is Lynn Holland. We are co-chairs of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. As a musician, I will tell you there's way too much reverb on this, so I hope you all can hear. Okay. Um, and these are our committee members. We spent part of last semester kind of brainstorming what we needed in terms of this, and we put together this presentation and white paper. So at this point, we have this as our SOAR analysis. Um, and you notice in strengths, we have a lot going on already on our campus. We have the structure built for diversity, equity, and inclusion, but as always with our opportunities, it could be better. Um, we do have aspirations and results listed here. So if you all are interested in reading that, please go to the website and look. Um, emerging themes and vision statements, I think you all can already see that you're beginning to see things that we have in common with one another, as Christian was talking about spaces and um, for all people on our campus. Um, we did notice as we were doing this that it's extremely important to know that diversity, equity, equity and inclusion should be included in everything that we do. Even though we are a separate committee, um, as we were going through thinking about some of this, it's like how does this affect this and this so we're very tied together with what we do on this campus and we need to be um, we did create a vision statement and a mission statement as a matter of fact we spent a lot of time working on our mission statement to get that right wording what is it that you really want to see on our campus in terms of this you can also read that on the website um, one of the things that we did when we first started this was to get a good definition of what diversity equity and equity and inclusion Meant. So we, we put those at the forefront of everything that we were doing. And then as we went on, realized that diversity, equity, and inclusion mean something different. Each one of those terms means something. Um, we, the diversity on our campus, we, we could do a lot better job with recruiting and retaining uh, diverse populations. Are we equitable on this campus? Is there equity among all people? And are we all included and do we have a voice? So. What we did was we broke everything that we talked about in our committee into three goals, and each one of those goals addressed one of those. So the first one is we will increase diversity across all sectors of our campus. Um, so WKU campus can um, enjoy the richness of diverse perspectives. So then you'll see goal number two is about equity so that all people are equal in this, in this journey that we have together and then that we're inclusive and we bring everybody's voice. So all three of those things are separated and what Lynn's gonna talk to you about is how we came up with the objectives and strategies to meet each of those goals. You want me to hit your buttons for you? Please. Okay. I have issues hitting the button. Yeah. So Molly's gonna do that. I'm the sous chef. <laughs> yes. So the objectives and, and what you're seeing today and what's on the PowerPoint are just a, a scaled down version of the many objectives that we have developed and spoke about within our committees over the last several months. And you'll also notice that there are some percentages here relative to our targets. And I wanna address that quickly in the sense that they are very ambitious, but that's intentional and on purpose. One, we were instructed to be aspirational. And so what you are seeing are aspirational things. The other piece is the sense of wanting to provoke conversation within the campus community about what we truly can do and can achieve as targets. The other thing that's important to note that with the diversity and equity inclusion plan that uh, was approved by CPE, that's a separate plan from this plan, 
although these two plans integrate quite nicely. And so that being the case, I invite you to wku.edu forward slash diversity, and you can see the diversity plan, which focuses on um, African-American students and African-American employees primarily, whereas this particular diversity plan focuses on a much broader, it's a much broader definition of, of diversity here. So just some of our uh, objectives, well, the objective for diversity, intentionally support the recruitment and retention of diverse faculty and staff at WKU and students as well. Focusing on increasing our uh, faculty and staff, our employees by 15% for our target year and then looking at 30% by our, uh, in a 10 year span. So some of the strategies there, I invite you to take a look at the PowerPoint that is on the website and feel free to provide Molly, myself, or other members of the committee with questions, concerns, your thoughts. Looking at objective two under the category of diversity, intentionally support recruitment and retention of diverse students at WKU. Again, very ambitious, ambitious targets there. I invite you to take a look at that and I invite you to pose questions, strategies on how we can achieve this. Under equity, create a common understanding of conscious and unconscious bias at WKU and across the nation in higher education in particular and in the business or uh, business partners, implicit, unconscious, conscious bias, those are contested terms and we're very much aware of that. We spend a great deal of time talking about this amongst the committee, but again, it's to the sense of the socialization process that all of us have experienced from the cradle to the time that we leave this place, we are continually being socialized into a particular way of thinking, but bringing that forward in the sense so that it's not tacit, but we are aware of what we think about ourselves and aware of what we think about others and how sometimes those things are in conflict. So as we look at one of the strategies here is to, to really examine and explore mandatory training for WKU employees, both faculty and staff, on this notion of how have we been socialized to think about ourselves and how we've been socialized to think about others and how that influences what we do and what we don't do as it relates to hiring, as it relates to recruitment, as it relates to even the pedagogical strategies that we, we adopt inside the classroom. And something that's critical too is reviewing the policies and the procedures that are oftentimes barriers or obstacles to creating that inclusive environment, an equitable environment. This emphasis on safety is something that bubbles up a lot, particularly with our students. And so we are intentional about working towards creating a uh, equitable and safe campus for the, the folks who, who choose to uh, join the WKU community and some intentionality about that there. So targets, decrease all intolerant behavior, targeting faculty and staff and students. In five years, let's working to reduce that by 75%. In 10 years, working to reduce that by 10%. It's ambitious. It's also to provoke conversation and thought. Um, you see some of the things down there as strategies. And you'll see this also with some of the other working groups that there's a connection to our tenure and promotion and continuance process in the performance appraisal process for, for staff. But you'll see that there are these, these themes that fold these uh, principles of equity and principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion into those practices of uh, continuance here at the institution. Inclusion, a couple of objectives there, create an environment that accommodates, includes, and celebrates all members of the WKU community. Target one year, 100% by that. Ambitious, aspirational. Strategies for that, just, just one of the things is hire and support a full-time cabinet level chief diversity officer position. <laughs> 
um, we think it's important to, to put that into our strategic plan. And then our last objective, I think, if I correctly, our last objective here is include all members of the WK community in institutional actions and initiatives. One of the things that we've learned is, as we have been drilling down on the strategic planning process is that there are pockets across the campus that feel as if we're not paying attention to them, that we're not hearing them. And so how can we communicate and then over communicate and then over communicate again and then devise mechanisms to hear and listen and invite folks to join the conversation. So we have some strategies here, provide support for internal and external leadership training to all WKU employees in, interested in institutional advancement, shepherding, mentoring, however we choose to, to uh, label those programs, include diversity and equity in our WKU vision statement and all of our marketing materials, examine our marketing materials, what are they communicating to an external audience, what are they communicating to an internal audience, is it the message that we want, are we over emphasizing some things and under emphasizing other things. Questions, concerns, thoughts? We have one from the regional campus. I'm sorry, one from the campus. Sorry. Just one from another campus. Question is, get my glasses on. Um, will timely responsiveness to change be considered as a guiding principle for the budget group? So this is a delay, sorry. I think we're going back one. Um, so the question again, will timely responsiveness to change be considered uh, as a guiding principle for the budget group? I'm gonna hand it back to Christian and I'm not, you can interpret that the way you want. Yes. <laughs> Clear, short, concise, okay. Um, we should say again that, remember we're not, this is not the budget committee, this is the budget strategic plan committee, so they are different. Yeah. Any questions, yeah. Um, there's a microphone right beside you, up here. Um, hi, everyone. I'm here representing the Student Government Association. My name's Savannah, and I'm the Executive Vice President. Um, I really enjoyed your all's portion of the presentation. I just had a question. Um, so do you all plan to include gender sensitivity or any sort of transgender LGBTQ plus um, sensitivity training for all faculty, or is that something that you all include in diversity? Yes. Yes. Okay. Emphatically. <laughs> emphatically yeah, so. Emphatically so. Yeah. Any other So you almost have to have, like we have safe zones right now, and we have this and we have that, but I, I think that, you know, you do have to break things down apart because what a diversity umbrella for acceptance and appreciation and biases and stuff will not work. Um, and I think that we have um, a very misunderstood group when it comes to gender identity, um, transgender, and those things on this campus. Because throw in the bathroom, this gender neutral ad, it doesn't address anything. And um, I think we need to move beyond that. So that would be my hope that we would have different training sessions for all of those things and that everyone's included. Another problem we have is hidden disabilities on this campus. Mm -hmm. So we don't, uh, food allergies are ADA compliant issues now and we have nothing for you all to eat on campus. It's a small little things that have the same food every day because I'm, I don't eat meat and I eat in the vegan section, it's the same thing every day. How can we, how can we make your life better if you have a peanut allergy or a gluten allergy or a religious, we have halal, we have kosher, we have, you know, have all of those things. So these are all really separate and you have to come at them from a different direction. So I appreciate the conversation, Savannah. And if you think about tactically, there are several things that we've talked about. And it's very similar to what we do sometimes 
when we are teaching in the classroom. There isn't a one size fits all. So we have explored, of course, what is, what is um, cost effective, creating a module or, or looking for uh, a module that others have, have created and purchasing those subscriptions. Uh, the other things that we've looked at is um, an ongoing communication series. I don't want to say lecture because that's oftentimes off-putting to people, but an ongoing series where we have an opportunity to communicate with each other. This is, these are long-term things that we're going to set in motion. They aren't things that we can, we can do tomorrow and expect everything to be okay. So multiple things that we, that we've explored with that and enlisting the support of students as well, because that's a critical piece of our population that as we focus on and emphasize cultural competency, it is vitally important. Our employers are asking us regularly that the folks that we graduate are culturally competent and that they're able to work with a wide uh, expanse of diversity. And so we are looking for strategies and it's, it's gonna be a combination of things in order to to meet that need. Thank you for the question. Hi, I'm Ryan Linton. Hey, Molly. Hey, Dr. Kirby, sorry. Um, so this might be a little bit redundant, but I'm wondering how are you planning to implement um, some of these procedures, particularly with the equity? There was not many um, listed on one of those slides with a focus on the WQPD. They are WKU employees, however, there have been, um, I hate to use the word, but it's accurate. So uh, there's been like neglect on their part in dealing with certain incidents of hate crime, particularly with uh, racial violence and LGBTQ community violence. I'm just curious on how you have, um, on specific strategies you plan on using in educating that, that particular staff and being more aware and sensitive to those crimes that happen on campus. Well, for one thing, um, with the strategic plan, we're kind of the people that are making the big idea, and the implementation of this will be driven by other people as we go through. Mm -hmm. So those are all things that we've, we've included in our objectives and the strategies underneath, like the mandatory training. But thankfully, we probably won't have to do it. <laughs> Right? So we take teams of people to do that with the implementation. So we're really not at that point about how it will work, um, but hopefully we'll have teams of people that will make that work. Okay. Um, well, maybe Lynn might be in charge of she does teach it. Yeah, so I hope that answers your question a little bit, kind of gives you an idea of where we're coming from with this and where it will go from on. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah, kind of. All right, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, if you've got one over there, go ahead, and I'll do this one next. After you. All right. Hello, my name's uh, Jaden. I'm a student here, and um, I guess this question would kind of be directed toward this committee. Um, so um, I know that a lot of times uh, first-generation college students often struggle with the college process as a whole because they're not often getting the help at home, and it can be little things that just. Per, um, create these barriers for these students. And so I was just kind of curious to what your committee was doing to work around um, those students and trying to get a more of a first generation student uh, population on campus. I'll take that one, yeah. In just a few moments, you will hear from the Student Success Working Group and you will note in their presentation and their working papers that there is emphasis on the first year student and helping that individual um, be successful here. Okay, great, thank you. We'll do one more from outside for this committee. What matrix is used to track tolerance on campus? And you may not have one yet, but what? I, I, it looks like a current question, yeah. What, what is being used? If you have an idea of what should be used, feel free to jump, but I, we realize you're not dealing with implementation yet. What matrix is used to track tolerance on campus? Well, since that's outside of this particular committee, I can tell you what happens in, in, in my office in real time. We have a, a portal that students and WKU employees can access through the WKU app. 
And if you go into that app, you will see a, a um, sort of a drop down menu of multiple portals to report different incidences here on campus. And so the bias incident reporting portal is a portal that comes directly to me and I track that. I don't use a matrix other than tally marks. We're old fashioned, I'm certainly old fashioned in, in that regard, but I keep tally marks. And so that's what, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing now. Great, thank you so much for the questions. Um, we're gonna go to research scholarship and creative endeavors with Dr. Madel. Okay, I'm Kelly Madol. Uh, my co-chair, Dave Tatman, couldn't be here today. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about where the committee stands right now. Um, so, um, in starting out this process, uh, one of the first things we did was to solicit uh, from department chairs and heads uh, for their particular unit, um, their strengths, challenges, and aspirations with regard to um, research, scholarship, and creative endeavors. Um, the committee, which had pretty good representation from around campus, also um, engaged in the same process, but at a more university-wide level. Um, we realized that there was a lot of, a fair amount of consistency, some common themes in terms of the university's strengths, um, that the university does value the research and creative endeavors that faculty are engaged in. We value the role that students play in this mission. Um, challenges, there is also um, a fair amount of consistency. So uh, primarily around the themes of uh, issues with regard to faculty workload, lack of funding, lack of resources to engage in the kinds of research, scholarship, and creative endeavors that we would like to do. Um, also, um, a lot of difficulty in achieving the kind of collaborative interdisciplinary work that we think we could do more of. When it comes to aspirations, um, a, a lot of what we, um, feedback we got, I would say, was um, not so much aspirational as it was, um, here's a lot of things that, need, that are broken that need to be fixed. So um, the committee had to really work a lot on that aspirational level of thinking. And then a lot of the, the feedback that we got in terms of, hey, you know, this is a real problem, um, we were able to incorporate that into our, our strategies. So um, we arrived at um, three, what we did was we sort of thought about this in terms of um, what is the role that our research, our scholarship, our creative endeavors plays in the academic life, in the life of the university. And that, that in, in that discussion, we sort of uh, distilled out these three goals, um, that we want our research, scholarship, and creative activities to advance students' personal and professional development, we want to raise the scholarly profile of the university, and that we want to use um, faculty and student expertise to improve quality of life in the region, support economic diversification in the region. And that latter one, the, this last goal is really one that Dave and a, a subcommittee of people, um, Jeff Hook and Ron Bunch worked um, more on that particular goal. Um, so we have, we're, we're sort of, this is, We've sort of got our goals and objectives pretty well in place, um, but we're, we're working a lot on the strategies aspect. And we have a lot of strategies. We've got a lot of good feedback, a lot of good ideas, and um, I could include only a subset of that here. Um, and so I welcome more in, in regard to the our more specifics on our objectives and strategies. Um, so with regard to advancing students' personal and professional development, um, a lot of these strategies have to do with um, undergraduate research, but, but you shouldn't see, see it as that that's all we're focused on because we're, we're also focused on, on the role of graduate students. Um, so we really need to, felt we need to expand a student's access to the kind of research and scholarship uh, mentoring within research and scholarly activities that we feel like the university is capable of. And that also involves increasing faculty involvement in that mentoring. Um, 
a lot of that has to do with, um, there's a lot of things that we need to put in place, I think, in terms of making that happen. And I think with regard to a lot of these strategies, one thing, you need to decide who's going to do that, right? Where is this going to happen? And so one of the strategies is to create an office that's specifically focused on undergraduate research, um, scholarship, and creative activities, and to really brand WKU as the kind of place where that can happen. Um, in terms of raising the scholarly profile of the university, um, this is where I think the graduate student research tends to come in a bit more heavily. Um, and we, it's a sort of pretty widespread agreement that we need to expand support for graduate student research, especially through graduate assistantships and funding for research. Um, and we need to um, uh, make sure that our administrative support mechanisms really align with that function, that we're not doing things that hold that up just because we've always done it that way. Um, finally, um, we want to expand what we do out into the community, um, use our expertise in the community, in the business world, and also um, help uh, the university's mission with the resources that are available out there. Um, and one of the things that, one of the things Dave has done is he's um, done a survey with local uh, business community to get their view of how it is to work with the university and their view of what they would like to do with regard to collaborations with the university. And um, one of the things that came out is, so far, and I haven't seen the results of the survey, but definitely the business community definitely sees it as difficult to work with the university, difficult to know what's available, difficult to know how the university can help out. So I think he will be working a lot more on what are the strategies that we need to do in order to help those collaborations occur. Um, so I invite you to look, in more uh, look at the PowerPoint in more detail and to provide any feedback that you would like to, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Hi, it's Ryan again. <clears throat> um, as an undergrad, I just have concerns over time, kind of, um, as Molly can attest, and I apologize. It, as an undergrad, it is, it's difficult to balance, um, you know, having a full workload trying to graduate on time, while also supporting yourself financially with like part-time jobs, but still wanting to participate in research. How, if this is addressed, I, how would you, how would we be able to include research in terms of creating that, let me start over. <laughs> right, I, I get what yeah, how can we incorporate that in? into right. like the everyday schedule, but also right. possibly make it count towards like a colony requirement or a major requirement? How is that a possible? Is that a possibility? And how it definitely is, and that's one of the things that we have suggested is that academic programs and possibly even the colonnade committee examine how we can better include uh, mentored student activities. And I think that mentoring is really important, so that it is part of the academic mission. Um, how can we include that in a way that? doesn't just mean you're doing that on top of everything else you're doing, but we really see it. I mean, one of the things if you find about, um, a lot of people have done research on undergraduate research, right? Undergraduate research is great. Prepare students for the workforce, helps um, retention, helps recruitment, helps better relationships between faculty and students, which is one thing that students really like. So we really need to see this as something that's central enough that we are willing to include it as part of, a central part of the academic mission, central part of the academic programming. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. And then we have Dr. Today. And student success and experience. Mm -hmm. Hi folks, my name is Jerry Today. I'm the co-chair of the Student Success and Experience Working Group. Uh, my colleague, Martha Sales, who also, also co-chaired this committee, uh, she's at a conference today, um, but she's listening through the, the Zoom system, so I'm sure she can text in if she says that I've done something wrong. Um, just like everyone else, uh, we did a SOAR analysis looking at our strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results. Like everyone else, I'll have you sort of read it on your own or look at it after the session. I do want to draw your attention to the bottom two blocks, though, the aspirations and the measurable, measurable results, because the information, especially in the lower left-hand box, is really guide in the spirit of the student success and experience uh, working group. Um, we believe that every student admitted to WKU will succeed. 
And that means if we admit you, we believe in you. It means that we believe that you have the capacity and the capability to graduate. And if we didn't believe that, we wouldn't admit you. Um, and we also believe that success doesn't necessarily mean getting a bachelor's degree. Someone may come here and just want a, a certificate. Someone may come here and just want to knock out some credit hours to try and improve themselves. Um, but it's our job to help students find their path towards success because one of the things we learned in our, in our discussion is that student success can be defined in a variety of ways. And so I don't want anyone to think that we think student success is just specifically getting a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. We really need to leave it up to the student, working with the student, mentoring the student to figure out what his or her path is. We need to provide a supportive, personalized, and non-bureaucratic environment. We want to make student success the center of the university. We want to create and promote a unique WKU student identity. One of the things we spent a lot of time talking about is what does it mean to be a WKU student? And we had a really hard time sort of pinpointing what that was. We talked to lots of students on campus. They had a hard time pinpointing what that was. Um, we want to build a sense of belonging among students, faculty, and staff. And we wanted to make sure that we're intentional about ingraining professional and transferable skills within our students. And believe, we believe we'll see this through increased retention uh, and graduation rates for all students. It's another theme you're going to see. We're focusing on all students on the camp in the campus community and through their paid employment upon graduation. And that could be from a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. Um, this was something Martha's adamant about and I fully support this important disclaimer. What I'm gonna show you just like everyone else is the goals and objectives that we've developed uh, for student success and the student experience. And we wanna make sure it's clear that what we're saying applies to everyone. It doesn't just apply to faculty or staff. Um, or certain segments of the staff like student affairs. This applies to every single individual on this campus. When we talk about student success and creating a powerful transformative student experience, it applies to everyone. And I just went on the website and tried to find every major vice president office that exists at this university. You work in IT, you're responsible for student success. If you work on the banner system or the, uh, or the uh, blackboard system, you are making a contribution to student success and you need to think about that. If you work in public affairs or finance and administration, you need to think clearly and purposely about how you contribute to the success of our students on campus. We want to make student success who we are as an institution. If you want, that's our vision statement. Student success is who we are and it's what we do. It's what we live. Student experience is everyone's job and student success applies to all students. It doesn't just apply to honor students or forensic students. It applies to every student on our campus. Our overarching goal, our mission, if you will, is to ensure that students are the center of an inclusive, supportive, and personalized learning environment that prepares them to lead successful, productive, and fulfilling lives. In our position, this should be the mission of the university as it applies to student success and the student experience. And we have two objectives. We wanna make student retention and degree completion the center of our institutional culture and structure. And we wanna make all students, we wanna prepare all students for academic success, professional competency and lifelong learning. Well, how do we do that? So we've got some strategies to try and achieve each of the objectives. Like many of the other working groups, we have lots of ideas. We've distilled these to eight, or eight ideas, eight strategies um, that we think give the best bang for the buck, best return on investment, that can yield a transformative experience for our students and really move our university over the next 10 years in a, in a, in a positive, better direction. Our first strategy for objective one is we want to reorganize student support services into one physical space and one organizational structure. We spent a lot of time talking about the WKU runaround and bureaucracy, where there's multiple offices doing the same things, overlapping with each other, and students don't know where to go to get the support that they need. One space, one location. Um, maybe there could be an office in DSU that has a representative from every student support office of so students just have to go to one spot. I know some of you are thinking, well, not all students are on campus. They're at regional campuses. They're online. How about one email address and one phone number and one number to text where they can get the answer they need? That's what we're talking about. One organizational structure, one location, one space. We believe we should articulate the impact of student success in every job description at w WKU. Explicitly articulated how this job impacts student success. If it doesn't impact student success, maybe it shouldn't exist. Use contributions to student success as a metric in the promotion and tenure and continuance process for faculty and in the annual re review process for staff. As a faculty member, I fully support this. 
What it looks like, I don't know. Is it student success is embedded into the three areas of teaching, research, and service, and the faculty member articulates how he or she promotes student success in those areas, or is it a separate category in the tenure and promotion process? That's something the University Senate is gonna have to work out in the Faculty Handbook Committee. Again, our job is visioning. What are, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna move forward? Establish and clearly articulate the total cost of attendance for all degree-seeking students. This is what it's gonna cost if you wanna get a bachelor's degree here or a master's degree. We clearly articulate it, no more surprises. And we wanna require all students to complete an academic plan, a financial plan, and a professional plan before the completion of their second semester at WKU so that students are intentional about what they wanna study in terms of an area. We're not talking about a specific major in their second semester. It's, you know what, I'm interested in health. I'm interested in the social sciences. I'm interested in the humanities. Then they spend some time thinking about what profession or area they might wanna work in and how they're gonna pay for it. This is so that students right off the bat are being intentional about what they're studying, what they might wanna do, and how they're gonna pay for it after they graduate. We didn't make this up. Lots of universities are doing it. We stole this idea from them. Um, just being honest. Um, we, have to, we had to link our strategies to various metrics or targets. And about five days before Christmas, I went and looked Bruce on the 20th of December. Bruce and Paula sent us the strategic plan. I uh, sent us the CPE uh, performance-based funding metrics and the CPE strategic agenda and said, as you develop your strategies, link them to some of these metrics. Um, and so there are a couple of metrics and targets that directly apply to student success that are in the CPE strategic agenda and the performance-based funding model um, and in the diversity plan. And we, we, we just stole these ideas, stole these metrics and targets from them. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them. For objective two, prepare all students for academic success, professional competency and lifelong learning. We're gonna repeat strategy five here. We think having students complete an academic plan, professional plan and financial plan will help us achieve the second objective as well. Coming back to one of the questions that was asked earlier, we believe that all students should complete one high impact practice per year of enrollment at this institution. So if you're here for four years, you do four of them. If you transfer in from KCTCS, you do two, two high impact practices. We think there's a real opportunity to create a meaningful, powerful first year experience to help socialize students into WKU, help build that WKU identity, help build that sense of community between faculty, staff, and students. And we think we also can do that through uh, some pervasive living learning communities for first year students. We want to embed professional competencies, things like intercultural competence, personal and social responsibility, and inquiry and analysis, things like evidence and argument, which we have as part of our QEP right now, into our coursework into academic programs, into student affairs programming, and even into student employment. There's a lot of universities across this country that are using student employment as a high impact practice. How can you, how can you create student employment opportunities that have the characteristics of a high impact practice where you teach these professional competencies? Student employment just shouldn't be a job where they're doing menial, menial tasks. Let's make it a transformative experience for students on our campus. And lastly, establish personal and professional linkages between current university students, alumni, and make parents and family a uh, partner in student success. Um, Chris Jensen, one of my colleagues on the committee, has said repeatedly that we hide behind FERPA too much. We could use parents more, we can use loved ones more to help us help their kids, their loved ones, be more successful at this university. And from what I've heard is alumni want to be involved as well. They just don't want to give money they want to help with the mentoring of our students as well. And we need to do a better job of establishing those linkages. Again, some metrics. I'm probably over time. These are the most awesome people who we've worked with over the last three months. I counted it today, 18 hours of meetings to create all of this. Can I take any questions? You know, I was sitting here and a thought occurred to me that the colonnade keeps sort of getting yep. brought up we, in academic excellence. We also, Kelly mentioned it in terms of research. Have you all talked about that? Because I love the idea of this one clearinghouse. Wouldn't it be great if we could have the colonnade in there as well? Because we have that first two years in particular. And right now we, we don't know when anything's going to be offered, where it is. I think our colonnade's brilliant. It's just it's not functioning quite like we meant for it to. 
But if you put that in there with an idea too, to stick the colonnade in with this centralized so that we've got somebody to get people in the seats. Some classes don't have any people in them. We got some overloaded. And I think if we balanced it and somebody was in charge of that and getting those people in there, I mean, that's a good connection with all of the three you all have going on. Uh, last year, last October, not this October, the October before, uh, Ken O'Donnell, who's sort of like a national expert on high impact practices, came to WKU. And through some workshops he did with faculty and staff and administrators, we realized that the Colonnade program is a unique place to embed some of these high impact practices like first year experience. It's something the provost and I have talked about, Rob and I have talked about it. Um, there is no room in the curriculum to add a first year seminar. There's no appetite on campus to do that. But what we can do is take the colonnade program and the way we structure learning communities, either living learning communities or commuter learning communities, and the way we structure how students take courses, what a first year experience might look like integrated into the colonnade program, it could work. And so, you know, I, I don't, I think people, I'm, I'm sharing the colonnade committee this year and yeah, it's, it's been fun. Um, the, the colonnade program is such a unique thing and an awesome thing that I think we need to double down on its success at this institution. So I agree, agree completely. And I'm glad I'm, we're seeing it in other presentations. Jerry, I have a question from outside, but it's not for you. It's actually, I think, for diversity. Perfect. But what we'll do is we'll get Mike up here and get his going, and while I ask the question, and then you guys might be able to answer it fast while we're doing this. Unless this up, I just basically, uh, I just lost it. Sorry. Um, it had to do with that. There's an international house on campus that gives a lot of visibility to those, but there's not really a, a place. The visibility for minorities on campus, there's really not a place per se, that's what the question's saying. So do you have thoughts about how, how you increase the visibility of the diversity on campus, I guess, which is pseudo an implementation thing, but it's part of your strategies probably, so. Well, we actually have the Intercultural Student Engagement Center, which is located in Downing Student Union in rooms 2041 and 2084, and that those spaces are designed for all students in, 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 a, in a general sense, but particularly for students of color and for our LGBTQIA plus students as well. So the Pride Center is in 2084, and we encourage folk to come by and spend some time with us there. You'll find incredible resources and an incredible staff there to help students get connected to each other, get connected to the institution, and certainly get connected to the support system that we have in order for them to be successful. Now, the goal, of course, is to expand those centers as we, as we move forward, but we, they're there. Okay. Thank you. Really, really quick. And I, th and I think sometimes, too, if, if um, we, our recruitment, our retention, all of those things are embedded in, that some of that kind of comes with that. So some of the things we've already talked about will help them prove that situation. No, 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 beautiful, love the passion. Uh, this is Mike Simpson, and he's gonna talk to us about the External Relations and Alumni Engagement Committee. Good afternoon, thank you. Uh, I'm, my capacity is as the chairman of the College Heights Foundation. I will quickly tell you, just to set the expectation for my presentation, my son sent me a text and I asked if I could get back to him. I was about to present to a group of faculty and staff. He replied, LOL. <laughs> so I've been confident up to that point. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for having me. Um, our group, I don't think we have it in the slide presentation, but it consists of representatives uh, volunteers and staff from the College Heights Foundation, the WKU Foundation, the Alumni Association, the Hilltopper Athletic Foundation, and the Board of Regents representative is Fred Higdon. Our overarching goal statement, and I'll read this and, and uh, uh, to support the WKU mission by fostering lifelong relationships with diverse stakeholders engaging all members of the WKU family in the life of the institution and securing philanthropic support to advance the university. Strategies include 
maximizing available resources to create an optimum organization. We spent, uh, we've spent a great deal of time talking about organization. Secure philanthropic support to advance the university. Educate diverse stakeholders on the importance of private support to the health and vitality of the institution. Engage all members of the WKU family in the life of the institution and to communicate the strategic plan to external constituents. Some examples of the action items include develop a more coordinated organizational structure for institutionally related foundation. Quickly, as I just described, there's the College Heights Foundation, the WKU Foundation, the Hilltopper Athletic Foundation, the WKU Real Estate Corporation, uh, and the Alumni Association. And what we have discovered organizationally is that uh, not all of those organizations have, have um, been most efficient in working collaboratively. It's a tough word for a non-academic to say. Um, so that we spent quite a bit of time on that. Uh, to initiate a campaign to support the initiatives outlined in the strategic plan. So much of this, uh, the groups assembled here will be an outgrowth of what comes from the total strategic plan, just as the past two capital campaigns have been organized in an effort to reach goals and targets, much of what this group will do will be an outgrowth of what the other committees um, assemble as the overreaching strategic plan for the university. Create more informed and engaged members of the WKU family. Uh, as was just mentioned, uh, alumni want to support this university and not always by writing a check. And how do we work with this university family to find ways in which alumni can uh, plug in here at this university. And to encourage all committees to inform and engage external constituents in the process. Sample metrics, uh, we've done a $100 million campaign. We've completed the $200 million campaign. Uh, the number that's been bantied about is to achieve a successful $250 million comprehensive campaign. Increase the combined university endowment to 200 million. Currently that sits at just over 100 million. Generate $25 million in annual private support. Conduct 150 cultural, social service, or educational events annually that engage members of the WKU family and to conduct pre and post surveys to measure effectiveness of communication efforts on elements of the strategic plan. So that Paula, okay. I think that's everything from our committee. I'd be happy to entertain any questions or comments you may have. Mike, something we've talked about on our committee a lot is just the untapped potential of alumni. Um, just to, for the same reason, a lot of them might not have money, especially recent graduates to write a check, but they wanna help and they've never been asked. So I think that's something we all need to think about in weaving in in the steering committee. Um, it is a huge untapped resource on this campus that we need, it, now's the time to ask. There's no question. And, and among the conversations we've had is that, and I forget the exact number, but there have been 30,000 alumni uh, graduated from this institution since there have been, has been any growth in the development or alumni staff. So when we look at how we reach alumni, it does take human resources to be able to pick up the phone and call and say, can you come and speak to my class? Uh, just to reach that many. And those are the young alumni who really can lend their talent maybe over their treasure at this point in their life. So 
That's an excellent point and one we have considered. Yes, sir. Hi, so you have an extremely strong focus on the, um, the relations of the WKU family and the stakeholders with in that sense. However, because WKU and the community of Bowling Green as a whole is so inextricably, inextricably linked, how do you, <clears throat> are there any plans or thoughts on how we can more effectively integrate the entire community of Bowling Green into the WKU family? Because not only are we the stakeholders, but also the entirety of Bowling Green and how much WKU has helped the entire community of Bowling Green, they're linked and they're stakeholders in their own right. It's a really good question. Um, one we have to continue to consider is how we keep Bowling Green incorporated into the life of this university. But what we really talked, spent a lot of time discussing is how do we go outside of these walls, so to speak, and beyond Bowling Green and not only domestically, but internationally to seek support and engagement. I will tell you that, that for a long period of time, this institution has relied heavily on uh, local business leaders, local alumni, and that there may be a sense of fatigue, just being entirely candid with you. Um, uh, and that we need to look beyond the boundaries of Warren County and Kentucky and the United States to our alumni and friends and how we engage them into the life of this university. All right, thank you. Thank you for your question. One question, One question from the outside was, how did you arrive at 150 events, that number of 150? your external email. One every two days. <laughs> I, you know, it, it's, it's somewhat of an ambiguous number, um, but one that we felt like was attainable. Um, uh, you know, 50 seemed like too few, 300 seemed fairly ambitious. Uh, we didn't draw it out of a hat. We did discuss it, and that just seemed like an achievable number, particularly from the outset. Other questions or comments? Thank yes. Free Alumni Association, any plans for a Free Alumni Association? Yes, there has been discussion of that. The question was, I believe, any discussion of a Pre Alumni Association? Yes. Also, we've discussed, and I think there's been some a conversation here about uh, how do you engage family support for student success. We have talked about uh, a parent's council uh, and really uh, increasing efforts to engage parents, not only in the lives of their children, we don't need helicopter parents down here necessarily, but engaging them in the life of this institution, particularly legacy parents. My son should be in class, Bob, uh, somewhere on campus as we speak. And um, uh, my sister serves on the National Alumni Association Board. Uh, those are natural targets for us and particularly parents of, of legacy students here. So yes on the pre-alumni and yes on engaging parents in the life of this institution. Other questions or comments? You all have been very kind, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you again for being here today. Uh, please stay tuned to the website for uh, continuing updates. Please continue to provide your input. We are hoping for another forum uh, later in March. So again, thank you, have a great evening. Thank you.